All right, guys. So I'm going to go ahead and start and everybody can just pop on uh, from the, the other call uh, later if they want to um, come on this. But I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Everybody in the chat, can you let me know if you can see this? Yep. All right. Awesome. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Lindsay Vaughn, and I am a new consultant here. And I'm going to be doing a European training. So this week, I'm doing Iceland, and then I'm going to be doing Budapest in two weeks. And then in October, I'll do two more, and then we'll have the same thing. So I recently just came back from doing an entire month in Europe. So I'm trying to give you all the tips and tricks for the different places that I went so you guys can book travel to Europe. So first, I'm going to do kind of like an overview just a general information. Then I'm going to talk about transportation, how to get to and from Iceland, and then we'll go into the different regions. So first, general information. Iceland is a little island in the North Atlantic, and this island is close to Greenland and the Faroe Islands, Scotland, and Norway. It takes about five hours from JFK to get there. There are also flights from Minneapolis and a few other uh, airports in the United States, but JFK being the main one. And then local to Western Europe, it takes about three to four hours. And then random fact, Iceland is the second largest island outside of Great Britain in Europe but it's the world's 18th largest. And so this is really just close to, if you vision Kentucky, it's, it's basically the state of Kentucky, the same size. Iceland is a good place for hikers and people to go, couples to go, families to go, a lot of different things there. And most of the time you're gonna want your clients to be there anywhere from eight to 10 days. So we'll go a little bit more into why so long later on. So transportation, like I was saying, Iceland takes about three to four hours on a flight from Western Europe and five to six hours uh, in North America. You're going to want your clients to have a rental car unless they are doing day tours. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on when I talk about the regions. But when you talk about rental cars, uh, most of the rental cars, they will say, here are the different types of insurance that you can buy. In Iceland, you're gonna want to buy every insurance possible. And the reason why is because the weather in Iceland changed like that. And so one minute, it could be really sunny. And then the next, it's like pouring down in hail. And so because of the different insurances, it's just to protect your clients. And so most of the major insurance, uh, car insurance companies cover things in Iceland. But one thing for your clients to really look at is some credit cards in the United States cover insurances for rental cars, and some of them don't. So if they're traveling to Iceland, just look at that and see if their cards will cover and then you won't have to pay for the extra insurance in Iceland. But I know with Bank of America, which is what I use, they didn't cover any. So they cover rental car insurance in the States, but not in Iceland. So just, just look at that. And uh, next thing is you can get there by flight, but you also have cruises going to Iceland. And so I've talked a little bit here about uh, the ferries. And so the ferries go from the Faroe Islands, which is another island in the Atlantic. And then also once a week, a ferry goes from Denmark to Iceland. And so those times are different depending on which tours and cruises you're sending people on. Next, we're going to talk about the different regions. And so I've kind of broken out the regions into like what is in the region and then major attractions 
for your clients. So first is Reykjavik and the capital area, then South Iceland, East Iceland, North Iceland, the West Fjords, West Iceland, Regnes Fjorna, and the Central Highlands. So first is Reykjavik, and this is a really cool place to go. If you want to see pictures, I have plenty of pictures. I just haven't added them. This is more like just a tips talking about Iceland, but I am more than welcome to share those pictures with you and you can send to clients. But Iceland with the, the downtown center is huge for culture and art scenes. So there are a lot of different murals. If you walk down the downtown area, you can stop and take photos. It's also well known for different cafes. And most of the cafes there do have Wi-Fi compared to some other cafes in Europe, they don't. But in Iceland, most of them do have Wi-Fi. And then also in Reykjavik, something that a lot of people don't know, it's super vibrant at night. And so the later you stay up, the later you see more people. And so most of the clubs and like nightlife doesn't start until midnight. And, you know, in the United States, we think that's kind of late, but uh, in Iceland, they stay up a lot. So uh, their bars, most of the time in the summertime, uh, open until 4, 4 a.m. So if you have people who are going for conferences or just want to go by themselves and they really like nightlife, they will have perfect options to, to do there. So in Reykjavik, there's also a lot of areas for runners and cyclists, which paved paths. In other parts of Iceland, there are not a ton of paved paths. So uh, you're just going to have to you know, get people to go mainly to uh, the downtown area if they want to walk around and see and take a bike. So attractions in Reykjavik, the first is the largest church in Iceland. So Iceland has a bunch of cute little churches if you just drive around the island, uh, but the largest church and the tallest church is in the downtown area. It's something that you don't want your clients to miss if they're really interested in architecture. And then they also have whale watching tours. Like I was talking about, the downtown area has a lot of murals. Uh, the Harper Concert Hall, which you have to book tickets in advance for that, but great concerts. They have people come from all over the world to perform there. So if your clients are really interested in mu uh, music, send them there. Then next are thermal pools. So there are thermal pools all over the island, but the one that's the best in the Reykjavik area is Sky Lagoon. And I will be talking a little bit about that and the Blue Lagoon later when I get to that region and like the differences between the two. But Sky Lagoon is a good, good thermal pool uh, for the downtown area. And then there's settlement, there are multiple museums. So the Settlement Exhibition Museum, Maritime Museum, there's a photography museum. There are a lot of different museums that people can go to if they're really interested in history or Viking culture. And then there are also cute lighthouses in the old harbor area that people can go to. Now, for people who want to do the murals or want to do different museums, you can go on Viator and put, give them your link that way and they can book through Viator or if you are booking on Vax, some of the museums and tour like walking tours you can add, but most of the stuff uh, for museums and walking tours you're gonna wanna add through Viator. So the next region is South Iceland. And this is by far my favorite, just because there are so many different things there. So there are waterfalls, there are glaciers, there's just a whole bunch of nature for your nature lovers. So this is the region where the Golden Circle route is. And so the Golden Circle is three things, which is the Thingvellir National Park, Golfoss Waterfall, and there's a geyser there as well. And so South Iceland is about an hour to an hour and a half from Reykjavik. And they do day tours from Reykjavik 
to the Golden Circle route. And so you can take a bus from a hotel um, or a specific bus location from downtown to these places and see and make an amazing day trip. But the thing that you need to know is most of the buses tell you like a specific time for your people to be there. Uh, a lot of people that I've met along my way, they missed their bus stop because people in Iceland are always early. So you're going to want to send your clients if they have a drop off time or pick up time of, you know, 8 a.m., you're going to want them to be there at 730 just so they don't miss anything because the buses like to be early and people like to be early in Iceland. So just people pay a bunch of money to do these day trips and you don't want them to miss things. So as you're going along in the South Iceland, you've got the Golden Circle area and then you've got other waterfalls going towards the coastline. So Sogafoss is the well-known uh, waterfall through that area. And then you go through, you keep going on the ring road and you hit glaciers where people can walk the glaciers, but uh, you also want them to take a, a guided tour because it's not really safe to walk glaciers by yourself. If you don't have the proper attire, like foot attire and attire, it's also extremely cold. So if people want to walk the glacier, book them on a tour for that. And then also, as you keep going towards the coastline, you're going to get to the Renus Fierna beach. And this beach is the prettiest beach in Iceland, but it's also the most dangerous. And so why I say that is about every two weeks, they have somebody there killed. And the reason is because they walk out into the water and the water and the tides are so strong that you don't have time to get back to uh, the area of the beach, like where it won't sweep you away. So a lot of people have died because the, the wave has just taken them. So if you are sending people to this beach, make sure they know not to get in the water because we obviously want our clients to be able to experience something great and we don't, we don't need death. And then the last part of South Iceland that is amazing is this Formicor. Um, I know it looks like a P, but it's, it's said different, like Icelandic words are spelled differently, but that's how you say it. And this is really just like a woodland area with the different mountains and glacial rivers. So next is on the, so we talked about uh, the capital, then we talked about the south, now we're going to the east. So East Iceland is home of the largest forest on the Iceland, uh, on the island. And this also has a bunch of streams and mountains. And there are the west fjords and the east fjords. So the east fjords is on the east side. And the east part of the island is really good and known for hiking and different horseback riding opportunities. So there are, again, on our Viator supplier, a bunch of tours where people can book uh, horseback riding. Now, the thing is, because East Iceland is a little further away from Reykjavik, people don't really do day tours from the, the downtown area to the east because it's so far. It's about five to six hours of a drive um, if you're just going straight. And so because of that time, they just don't do day tours. So if your people are going to want to visit the east and the north part of the island, uh, I suggest them getting accommodations or camping, renting a camper van. That's what I did. Next, I'm going to be talking about the things on the east side of the island of what to do. So there is a huge national park there, which is called Vortikor National Park. And this national park, there are three national parks in Iceland, but this one takes one eighth of the island. So it's massive. And another thing to know, uh, going into the national parks, you have to pay for parking. And if you pay with a credit card, they block your most American credit cards are blocked for the national parks. So I would suggest 
getting a debit card and having a pin number so you can put the pin number the same with getting gas uh, always go debit uh, through these little stops because if not then they'll just block your card and then you won't be able to go and purchase things uh, longer on the trip so next are the giant boulders and then right next to the giant boulders is the door of mountains. So you can see the boulders and look at the mountains on the east side. And then there's also the highest, the second highest waterfall, which is called Hingafoss. And then you have Crater Lakes. And then you have Vesterhorn, which is another place that people are going to want to stop by. There are a bunch of different accommodations there that people can stop and camp or have little hotels and go there. Next is the north part of Iceland. This is the part of Iceland that a lot of people don't make it to unless they are doing the entire ring road. And the entire ring road takes people anywhere from eight to 10 days, depending on how long they stop at each spot. Now for me, the photographer, I did not make it in 10 days to get through everything because I liked stopping and taking photos, but most times it takes eight to 10 days to get through the entire island. And so on the north part of the island, there is amazing views of a few different lakes. So I'll talk about that later on, but this is where you're gonna see the Arctic Circle. And in Iceland in the summertime, it does not like get dark. And so in some of the places on the island, like it gets a little dim, but at the north part, it just stays light the entire time. So if people really just want to go up there and go to the lakes and just chill out, they can stay there and they can stay there for however long in the summertime. And then on the flip side, in the wintertime, because you're in the north, it gets dark really quickly. So there's not a lot of light. But the good thing for this is this is an amazing area to see the Northern Lights. So if you're sending people in the winter time who want to just see the Northern Lights, send them to the North, because that's where most of the time you're going to see the Northern Lights for multiple days. There are also whale opportunities to go whale watching at the North and in Reykjavik. Both are amazing, but most of the, the exotic whales and different species are in the north. So attractions in North Iceland, like I was talking about, there are lakes. Mivaton Lake is the by far prettiest lake in Iceland. Most of your uh, Icelander people tell you that every time you go talk to them. So if you're sending people to the north, send them there. Then they also have a geothermal spa attached to the lake so people can do uh, the entire day at the lake where they can go out to the lake and sit at the spa. You can sit there however long. Then the next thing are going to be craters. And so there are craters throughout the entire island, but these craters in the north are where you can actually like get to a platform and look down into them and look at all of the volcanic ash and the different parts of the crater, which I think are really cool. And so in the north part is where most of the craters are most symmetrical and they're, they're very amazing just to look down into. There are also amazing cliffs up in the north part and lava caves where people can go into and just hike in the caves and look at the caves. And then there are also other waterfalls in the north. So next region is the West Fjords. And this region is not a region that it, so you know how I was talking about the ring road, how it takes eight to 10 days to go around. This region is not on the ring road. So you have the entire ring road, which is the only highway um, on the island. This is off on, so you have north, this is on the west side. And normally it takes about four to six days to go through just the west fjords because most of the roads are not paved. This is the very weird part of Iceland where you go like this through roads 
And obviously it takes you much longer because roads are not paved. So you're gonna wanna go slower and all the things to stop and see things and make sure your vehicle doesn't get trashed with all of the gravel. Uh, but it's still an amazing area to go to. There are other cliffs there. And an amazing thing about the West Fjords is that most of your bird life is there. So there are 131 different bird species that live and breed on the cliffs of the West Fjords. So if you have clients who are really interested in nature photography or photography or just bird watching in general, I would send them there and also let them know like it's gonna take you a while to get there, but it's definitely worth their time. And then there are also other waterfalls through the West Fjords for them to go to. Uh, there are waterfalls all throughout the islands. So people can pick if they wanna do all waterfalls or a few different waterfalls, but things to do in uh, the West Fjords. So like I was saying, there are geothermal pools all over the island, but there are a few up there. Then there's the westernmost point, which has all of the different seabirds and birds. And then also weirdly enough, the West Fjords has a sorcery and witchcraft museum where people can go to and the, the timings of the museum are a little weird. So have you know people check that before you send them there, but it's a really cool museum to if your clients are interested in, in different things. So next is the west part of Iceland. So we're coming back around, which is the most diverse part of Iceland. And this is because there are waterfalls, there are volcanoes, and there are also rivers and farmland, which is really weird to have all of those combined, but it makes gorgeous scenery and it makes gorgeous photos. There is the Seifel's Nest uh, National Park there, which it goes through farmland and then it also goes around to coast the coastline, which you can see other cliffs and see more birds there as well. And then there are multiple volcanoes topped with glaciers in that national park that you can see. So the next part of things that you can see in Iceland, like I was talking about, Snæfellsnes uh, National Park, then the second largest glacier, Langefjöll, is there. And then you have my favorite mountain to look at and take photos of is Kirkafell Mountain. And this is another place where your clients have to pay to park and again, have a debit card for a pin number, but is worth, worth the money. And what you can do is park at this area and then walk down a few stairs. And then you see a, water, a, a waterfall that has three different waterfalls connected. People can go into the bottom part if they bring their uh, swimming suits and towels or you know just a change of clothes. And then you can see the mountain in the background. Another thing for avid hikers is people can hike the mountain, but uh, that is one of the most strenuous hikes in Iceland. So I wouldn't send people who just don't have a lot of experience hiking because obviously you, you, you don't want them getting stuck or getting hurt. And then the last thing in West Iceland to see is the cute little tiny village of Arnastabi and Helnar. And these are cute little fishing villages and they also have camping areas for people if they're wanting to take their camper van or they have little hotels. Uh, but in Arnastapi, there is a cute little camping area that has a hiking rocks and hiking area for people to go to. And you can see this arch that is uh, like na nature, it doesn't have a name, it's just called the arch. And so most people go there just to hike like in the morning after they've camped there for the night. So it's a really cool, cool spot for people to go to. So the next region is Renus Fien, and this is closer back to downtown, but it is where the Blue Lagoon is and multiple lighthouses. And so the Blue Lagoon is the biggest lagoon 
in Iceland. I've talked about other lagoons and ge geothermal pools all over, but the Blue Lagoon, a lot of people like. Uh, I liked it, but I would suggest sending clients if they're more into like private and wanting their own space for things, I would send them to the Sky Lagoon uh, in Reykjavik. The Blue Lagoon is, in my eyes, just a whole bunch of uh, people coming together and there's just a lot of people. And with COVID, some clients don't want to be uh, that close to people. So uh, those are the two options that you can you can have. You know, obviously it's a good place, but if your clients are wanting more private, I would send them to the other one. This is uh, close to the airport, which is in Kalavik. And the airport is a good 45 minutes of a drive from Reykjavik. And so if you are sending people on different day tours, you're going to want to take that into consideration uh, because they have to drive into Reykjavik. Another thing is that most of the rental car facilities take a while to, even though you've got a confirmation, they take a while to uh, get the cars and all of that. So just plan accordingly if people are wanting to do day tours from Reykjavik and they're flying in uh, at Kalavik. So the next thing about this area is that it is well known for volcanoes. So I don't know if anybody has been keeping up with the news lately, but the day after I left, um, August the 1st, there was a volcanic eruption in this area. And uh, I kind of felt it as I was leaving. Um, I actually went through an earthquake while I was there. So this region has a bunch of earthquakes. They're, they're small, uh, but it's an, interesting, it's an interesting experience, I will say. Uh, but if people are wanting to look at the volcano that has erupted, it's a good place to go. Uh, I wouldn't suggest taking kids because of uh, because it's new, it's a has a bunch of pollutants in the air, and so a lot of scientists right now are going and doing a bunch of science experiments on the lava. But they're taking pollutant suits and like protecting themselves because of all of the the toxins. So uh, if you're interested in science, obviously it's a cool place to go. But just uh, take care of yourself and know that there are risk. And then the next part of this region, there is a museum of rock and roll, and there is also a Viking World Museum, which is an amazing museum. It has a bunch of Viking history and just talks about uh, the Vikings tour, uh, coming to Iceland and tearing down things and rebuilding. So it's, it's a really cool area. And then the last region is the Central Highlands. And this region is basically a region that is virtually inaccessible. A lot of people don't go into this area because you need a four, strong four-wheel drive to go into this area. Most of the rental cars uh, that they give you at the rental facilities do not make it into the Highlands. So uh, if your clients are wanting to go to the Highlands, I would strongly suggest they book a tour with a guide from either Mirgard or uh, Iceland Tours or some one of the other tour companies that has a, a strong Jeep to get through because they'll be driving through rivers. Uh, it's a really amazing experience to do, but we just want them to be safe and we don't want uh, people drowning trying to go through rivers and they haven't driven through that before. So just, uh, you know, give your clients those tips. It's a cool place to go through the summer, uh, but again, virtually inaccessible during the winter time. And then these are just a few places in the Highlands for people to go on foot. So there are a few, like if you're going straight into the Highlands at the bottom, there are a few different campsites which you can make on the, the strong you know, four wheel drive just from a rental company, but you're gonna want to have somebody else help you get to uh, further areas up into uh, Iceland. 
but this is the rest of my presentation. So I'm going to take questions now. So you guys can unmute if you want uh, to.